Hey, my name is Jay Warner Wallace, and I'm the author of Cold Case Christianity. I, I got to tell you, if you're listening to this radio, you know that you're in a good place. And I cannot endorse more highly the intellect and the passion of your host. So just enjoy this radio program. Is he a real one? Radio is the real thing. And Veda, thank you so much for doing the most important work of the kingdom. Hello out there, this is Bobby Conway. You're listening to Is He a Real One Radio? And I'm now passing the baton off to my man, Veda. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? I'm praying and hoping that all is well with you. You know, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and anything else that may be going on in your lives, I am here to greet you. Say hello in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our triune God who loves us dearly, you know, and who loves us so much that he left us 66 love letters for us to read. He don't got to explain nothing to us, but he chose to, you know, so, so is he a real radio wants to welcome you. If you are listening on iHeartRadio, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. If you're listening on Spotify, if you're listening on iTunes, if you're listening on the TuneIn app, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate your viewership and your listening ship. And if you are listening and watching on YouTube, I want to wave at you. I want to wave at you. And as I introduce my, uh, and, and Vince Bantu, you know, waved at you too, but you couldn't see him because he ain't on screen yet, you know. <laughs> but Vince Bantu is our guest. Actually, Vince, you don't know this yet, but you're actually the first person to be on the show twice. So ain't nobody else. So, you know, I, through the, through the grace, favor, and power of the Holy Spirit, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, scholars and esteemed authors and debates and whatnot you know teach on on this program but you're actually the first one to show up two times you know i think we're gonna have michael we might have michael heiser on soon and he'll be on there two times but you're the first person to be on twice so yeah so we have dr vince bantu he is the assistant professor of church history and black church studies at fuller theological seminary he is a powerful powerful man of god so much information, so much information. And he, the reason he is on a second time is to talk about his book that came out recently and I strongly recommend. Can y'all see that there? A Multitude of All Peoples. Now, if you are already familiar with Dr. Vince Bantu, perhaps you've heard him teach on, you know, uh, ancient, Christ, uh, ancient Christianity and Africa and in other areas and things like that. And this subject is a really good apologetic to things like is Christianity the white man's religion, primarily because he's talking about the historicity in Christendom, period. A lot of it, it, there's some in Africa, there's some in other places, and this is all way before the transatlantic. So oftentimes, even myself included, will interview Vince Bantu for that reason and in that context. So on today's show, we'll hear some of that, but we'll hear it in a wider context as well, because this book is really, it does an excellent job at a scholarly level of just walking us through church history, church history and how it spread. You know, we, we, we know about the manuscripts that are in different languages and how they were found in different locations and things like that. So that's a great, you know, way to know, okay, well, Christianity clearly spread in, in, in different ways. If you can familiarize yourself with how manuscripts and Bibles were put together in different areas and different time periods. But this book right here is a, is a great area to just know of different leaders, different emperors and bishops and different locations. And some of it is in Africa, but some of it is in Syria and we'll get into that. But I just want to strongly recommend this book before we get into it. So Vince, would you like to introduce yourself further and say anything else about the book before we dive into it? Oh yeah, well, uh, man, uh, just first of all, I want to just give a shout out to uh, uh, you, my brother, and, and just this podcast, and thank you so much, man, for having me back on. It's an honor, man, to be uh, the first, the first repeat visitor. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, I, I just, man, I really appreciate the ministry that you're doing, bringing on so many leaders and apologists and 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 pastors and and and, and scholars and just folks that can really equip uh, the saints in the body of Christ. Uh, and, and so, uh, and really, that's that's exactly what the book is is you know the hope and the the aspiration is that the book will serve the same exact purpose just in book form uh so that you know people can listen to these different podcasts that that you're doing these different speakers and hopefully go dive a little deeper 
Um, and yeah, that's really what the book is all about is as we've had, you know, the, uh, and, and as, as you know, we have many, so we were talking before we started, we have many similar uh, connections and, and friends and, and colleagues really in this ministry of, you know, urban apologetics and, and, and spreading the gospel, especially in the black community and in other uh, diverse uh, communities where, you know, Christianity and the gospel has a certain uh, reputation and there's certain yeah. thoughts and issues that you run into. Um, but praise God that there's been so many people like yourself and, and other like conferences, uh, podcasts, um, you know, uh, curriculum. There's so many different ways that, that, that the saints have risen up to address this, uh, the, this issue in contextualized ways. And so really the hope is that the book can just be a supplement and just a partner to all this, this kingdom effort uh, so that maybe folks that are ready to can go a little deeper and dig deep. You know, it's meant to be kind of like a... Um, kind of like a halfway point in between like, you know, like a straight up academic book that people might not even get because it's too academic. Right, like, you know, right. Like, right. You, know, you know, it's in some university library, but it's also not like straight up, you know, kind of like everyday devotional type material either. It's kind of yeah, like yeah. somewhere in between, you know, that's the hope. It, nah, and you, you did a great job. That's exactly how it came off to me. You did a great job of, you, you did a great job in doing that. And you touched on something. I'll kind of just piggyback on something that you said to get us started, bro. Because uh, you mentioned the perception. Now, again, oftentimes when you're asked to speak somewhere, uh, do an interview on a, on a radio show or a podcast, a lot of times it's not only is, is Christianity a white man's religion, but that is, you are like, when that topic does come up, you are one of the top people who like, who people like to request. And the reason for that is the, you know, is because of your ability to teach about church history uh, as it pertains to Christianity and the different areas that Christianity spread. But but I think that this subject is so much more bigger than that. Yes, that's important, particularly in the black community in America. Let's not act like it's not important. I think it's a ridiculous, it, I know it is a ridiculous objection, but we know that because we've studied it, right? And so many people haven't. But even before we get there, like, why would you say that perception matters? Like, I know that I know that, again, it's important when that topic of, is it the white man's religion comes up? And I get that. But again, I think that the studies that you demonstrate in this book is so much bigger than that one objection. It is so much bigger than just one topic, you know, and perception does matter. Can you tell us why perception matters? Not just in the whole quote unquote white man's religion context, but just in general with people identifying uh, themselves in, in their Lord and Savior? Yeah, no, most definitely. I mean, you know, I think that I think perception matters first and foremost because because God says it matters, right? I mean, God in His infinite uh, existence communicates to us through like anthropomorphic methodologies. I mean, the Bible talks about God having eyes and ears and a nose and, mm. and a heart and all these kind of things that we can understand and relate to. And God incarnates Himself uh, as a human being, fully God and fully man. And God speak. He he. God is eternally. You mentioned at the beginning that we serve the triune God. God is in relationship. He's a he's a father mm. and a son at the same time in the Holy Spirit. And so again, these are these are concepts that we are made in His image, male and female. And so in that sense, like God has shown that He it's important to Him that that people see themselves reflected in Him. That mm. that all of these different relational and familial and gendered. Uh, terms uh, that, that the Bible says that it is in those areas and aspects that we are in his image. Uh, and so because God is male and female and God is father and son, God is black and white and Asian and Native American, like all, we should be able to see ourselves reflected in him because God re reveals himself in diverse. God is diversity. You can't have unity without diversity. Because mm. you can't you can't unify things if they're not different. So they that have to, so good. It's, it's predicated upon things being different in order for you to unify them. And mm. and so and so it's important for uh for all people, for all peoples, <laughs> the multitude of all people that we are, <laughs> to see and feel ourselves reflected in God Himself, uh, that we are made in His image, that blackness is a part of God's image. And so is uh Native American and Asian and white and, and, and Hispanic, and every culture is all made in God's image, just like male and female are equally made in his image. And if we're not seeing that, if we're not feeling that, if we're not, if that's not being reflected in the way church is being done, 
um, then I'm not trying to let people off the hook necessarily because again, at, at the end of the day, all of us are held accountable for our response to the gospel message and God's pursuit of us in Christ Jesus. But at the same time, I think that it's understandable that that so many people, as you said, it's it's not true. It's a false perception, but it's a very real perception. I would go so far as to say that the perception that Christianity is the white man's religion is the single greatest obstacle to the gospel in the world. Because as you mentioned, as you mentioned, it's not just for the black community, but it's for the Native American community, for people in India and in China, in the Middle East. Uh, in Africa. And I know what people will say. People are going to say, well, but the church is blowing up all over those places. I'm like, yes, it is. It, and that's, and praise God for that. But I'm talking about the people who aren't Christians in those places. I'm talking to people who don't want to receive Jesus. When you talk to those people, when you talk to Black and African and Asian and Middle Eastern and Native American non-Christians, and you ask them, why don't you want to be a Christian? I guarantee you that cultural identity is the number one reason why so many people don't want to be a Christian. Because they'll say, that's not, you know, Japanese people say that's a Western religion. That's not a Jap that's not for that's not for me. You know, people in India will say that's a that's a British colonial religion. That's not mm. for me. And and no matter where you are in the world, if you're dealing with non-Christians, that's the number one reason. And that shows in and of itself why perception is so important. I I'll say one more thing about by way of analogy that you know, when we look at the history of, of music in America, black people have been uh, single-handedly responsible for all of the musical genres that have developed in American history. Uh, and yet, most people wouldn't know that, that in several respects, because when you think about rock and roll, uh, or when you think about jazz, you don't, uh, especially as it's been practiced for like, say, the last 40 years, as those musical art forms have been practiced, that you don't normally think about black people uh, because it's been mostly co-opted by white people. Mm -hmm. And historically, those genres of music were created by black people, but they were co-opted by white people. And to the point now where black folks moved on to other musical genres. And so now if you look, the majority of jazz musicians or rock and roll musicians uh, have been white. But that, and, and, and even despite the fact that, that jazz music or rock and roll music started with black people, it does nothing to change the that 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 reality does nothing to change the perception that those are not no those are no longer black musical forms and so you don't see people doing it in the black community the way they used to in the 50s or in the 30s and so because it's now perceived as that's not part of our culture that's not part wow. you know young brothers and sisters in the hood ain't trying to play jazz music they're not trying to play uh, rock and roll music because it's perceived as that's not part of our culture when in fact we invented it and so it's this so in the same way that's a cautionary tale to help us remember that even despite the fact that christianity at its core is a global religion the perception that it isn't and the perception that it's only for white people it, it that perception becomes reality and it results in the crisis we have now of literally millions and billions of people rejecting the gospel because they see it as not even a cultural option for them. Wow. You know, and uh, I, I will reiterate, we will touch on that again, because again, it's an important issue and we can't skate around it. But if y'all hear me continuing to repeat that this study of cultural identity and, and multiple uh, people and multiple uh, areas around the globe identifying themselves in Christ is much bigger than that. It's because I don't want people to hear this and think, okay, this is only about the um, white man's religion thing or only about black people. It's, it's much bigger than that. Although in the context of Vince and myself, it's something that's super duper relevant. So we can't, <laughs> anytime we talk about it, it's going to come up. I, before I move on, I'll even mention this. A large part of my training and start and starting in in Christian apologetics, you know, comes from, you know, the Jim Warner Wallace's of the world, the Frank Turek's, the Sean McDowell's, you know, the Gary Habermas's, you know, uh, th these great people who many people know and love and go, wow, these are excellent teachers, you know, Greg Kokel, you know, different stuff like that. Things that I learned from them, you know, I'm able to learn, okay, how to defend the gospel, the historicity of the Bible. Um, I'm equipped on how to, you know, talk about morality and things like that. When I start defending the faith in, 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 in a black culture, that's like the 
fifth or sixth thing that even comes up. It's so much stuff that be, because of what Vince just said. Okay, is it even a white man's religion about this, about that? You know, and people really press on the whole um, Greek mythology, ancient Egypt mythology stuff mm-hmm. because they feel like they can identify with their ancestors. They'll even say, I know that Horus is a false god, but it's almost mm-hmm. like they would feel more comfortable worshiping that false god opposed to Jesus, which they think is a false god because at least their ancestors did that. They can identify with that. So it's so many roadblocks before we could even get to the gospel, before mm-hmm. we could even get to, okay, should these do these books belong in the Bible? You know, before we could even get there, it's just so many roadblocks. So, you know, I, I love what you mentioned about, you know, um, uh, about identity, you know, and, and, and about diversity, you know, uh, in, in the body of Christ. How does, how does the book, A Multitude of All Peoples, how does the book help us with that? Mm, yeah, well, I appreciate you asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there, there's really like, there's really two main things that the book uh, attempts to do um, is uh, number one, it, in the first chapter, uh, you know, which is actually, you know, pretty, it's, it's, it's the longest one. And, and it was actually originally going to be several chapters, but we wanted to really be able to give, may, highlight the, the second thing that I'm going to come back to, which is the main emphasis. But the first thing is to help give a historical understanding of how it got to that point, because we know Christianity mm. is not, uh, is not a, any man's religion. It's right. not, you know, again, if it was ever going to be any person's religion, it was going to be the Jews because the Jews. all yeah. the, all the early Christians were, Jesus was Jewish, apostles were Jewish. The, all the, the prophets before Jesus and, and the, the kings of Israel and the prophets of Israel were all Jewish. So if anybody, if Christianity was ever going to belong to any culture the same way that uh, Hinduism belongs to Indian people or that Islam belongs to Arab people or that Navajo religion belongs to Navajo people or, um, and so on and so forth, Yoruba religion belongs to Yoruba. Most religions are connected to one particular culture. And for that reason, they don't really spread outside of that culture. And if they do, like Islam, there's still a cultural deference that happens. Like anybody could be a Muslim, but you better learn how to speak Arabic. Uh, and you better start dressing like an Arab person. You better go visit Mecca, which is in you know Arabia. And, and so there's still a built-in cultural supremacy, even in Islam and many other religions as well. But Christianity is the only faith that is truly global and, it, and, it, and that in its sacred text, it, it smashes and obliterates smashes any it, yeah. attempt to say that this is for one people. The entire New Testament from Matthew to Revelation is, is underlining the point that this, and actually the Old Testament does as well, that this is not just for Jewish people. That he says, yeah, I've called you to be a light to the nations. And, and, and again, the title of the book comes from the fact that Jacob said that his descendants will be a multitude of all people. Yeah. And that Abraham said, God told Abraham, your descendants will be blessed. Uh, all, all seed will be blessed through your seed. And, and so Jesus is the fulfillment of that, or more specifically, the, the, the explosion and the expansion of the gospel into Gentile people, starting with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and going forward, that that's the fulfillment of that promise that was from the very beginning. And so, uh, and, and not only that, uh, Acts 10 shows us that Gentiles are admitted into the covenant people of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul makes it very clear, it's not about circumcision. It's not about observing the law because even we couldn't do that, but it's about faith in Christ. It's about circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit. That's what makes, uh, that's what that's what brings one into becoming a true Israelite, so to speak, or being a true Jew is one of the circumcised of the heart. And so, but not only that, but not only are non-Jews admissible and part of the body of Christ and part of the people of God, but they can still stay as they are. They don't have to culturally assimilate. It's not like they can say, well, yeah, you can become part of the people of God, but you have to get circumcised and you have to, you know, do all these Jewish customs. Say, no, you can actually not get circumcised. And that is a symbol for saying you stay a, a Gentile. But that doesn't mean that Jewish Christians will stop getting circumcised. They're going to a Jewish Christian and a Gentile Christian in the Bible are brother and sister in Christ, and they're united in Christ. But that doesn't stop the Jew from being a Jew. It doesn't stop the Gentile from being a Gentile. Galatians 3.28, when he says there is no Jew or Gentile, that's not saying that Gentile identity is now null and void or that Jewish identity is now null and void. What it's saying is that God does not love one of them more or prize one of them more. One of them is not more important than the other. 
Just like when he says there's no male or female. That doesn't mean we stop being a man or stop being a woman when you become saved. You become a better man and a better woman. And your identity as a man is reflected by God because men are made in the image of God. God is masculine. God is feminine. That's why God is spoken of as a mother and throughout scripture because women are made in the image of God. So when a woman becomes saved, they become a true and completed woman. And just in the same way, if you want to be really black, then be a Christian. Being, black, being a Christian doesn't mean you got to leave your blackness at the door. In fact, it means your blackness is fulfilled in Christ because God's the one who created black. And the same goes for any other culture. That's what Paul said when a true Jew is not one who's only one inwardly. And so Paul is basically saying, if you want to be a real Jew, you be a Christian. And so right. it's the same thing that in Christ, our cultures and our identities are magnified. They're perfected and they are sanctified and purified and they are magnified. And, and it all goes to the glory of God. When, when John looked up in heaven, he saw a multitude of every tribe, nation, and tongue. And all of our differences are meant to just magnify the beauty of God. So we know that's the beginning of the story. So the first part of the book, the intention is to help us understand how did we get from that? How did we get from that beautiful Pentecost Acts 2, Holy Spirit falls down and every tribe, nation, and tongue is, again, magnified. It's not like everybody spoke Hebrew, everybody spoke Aramaic, but it said, no, each one heard him in his own language. When God's spirit falls, barriers also fall and, and people are reconciled, but that doesn't mean that everybody acts one way. Everybody still acts their own, everybody still embraces their own identity. How do we get from that to slave ships? to you know, manifest destiny, to uh, mission boarding schools, to slavery, to slave religion, uh, to colonial uh, globalized Christianity. How did we get from there to there? The first book is me basically meant to answer that question and describe how, it, how Christianity went from uh, being a caricaturized by a global religion that, to then all of a sudden being perceived as a Western religion, which is not something that started uh, in the transatlantic slave trade and Western colonialism, but it's really something that was building up for a thousand years before Europeans ever decided to get on boats and go enslave people and take over people's land, so-called in the name of Jesus. That was a process that had been developing. It wasn't just like someone turned on a light switch. So the, the whole first chapter is meant to help us get some historical background into what went wrong and how that happened. And hopefully it can be a cautionary tale for those of us in the church today to avoid those same kind of mistakes. And then the second thing is really the bulk of what the book is about is to look at the other side of the story, to look at the understudied, the underutilized, and the, the aspect, the whole other African and Middle Eastern and Asian side of church history that's pre-colonial. Uh, because again, as you mentioned, like a lot of different groups who, are, who, who, don't, who reject the gospel, they will say it's a white man's religion. Now we could point to the reality, we could point to the fact that as Philip Jenkins says in his book, The Next Christendom, we could point to the reality that Christianity is actually, there's more Christians in the global South than there is in the global North. There's more in Africa and Asia and, and in uh, Latin America than there is in Europe or North America. But someone can always just push back and say, yeah, that's because of Western colonialism. And when you look at the majority of the churches in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, they came from Western missionaries and Western colonists who um, the, those missionaries oftentimes, uh, more times than not, were working with the colonists in stealing land and enslaving people. So, you know, that's, that's still where it came from. And they can say that, you know, Christians of color today are just following a white man's religion in mass numbers. And it's basically, they can make the argument that Christianity, global Christianity today is basically just a religious version of a Starbucks or a McDonald's or, or Disney. It's just more Western globalization spreading all over the place. And that's exactly why I wanted so much to focus in the, in the, in the majority of the book in the second, third, and fourth chapters on how Christianity grew specifically from the origins and how it continued to grow in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Asia, way before Europeans ever stepped foot on any of those places to, again, set to rest any idea. Oh, no. You breaking up, bro. You breaking up. So oh, we no, missed, I, I, yeah, I, I missed, I, yeah, I missed the last, I missed the last part of what you said. You remember the last few sentences you said? Uh, Satan, you get no victory. Oh, no, I was just in the Middle East and Asia uh, to show the other story uh, that has often been, you know, even in most seminaries and Christian colleges. 
Okay, no doubt. So you still kind of, um, you, you're still a little choppy there. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to ask you another question. If I sit, if I notice that there's another problem, I'm going to just ask you to phone in because I don't want people to miss any of the great stuff that you, uh, that, that you're saying, but we'll just try to press through a little bit. And if, if I notice that it comes up again, I'll just, um, you know, we'll just make a couple of adjustments. Now, I, I want to highlight something that, that you, that you mentioned in that soliloquy you just said, because you, you didn't say that it, you specified that yes, different cultures might have different customs that are culturally normal and magnified and in, um, in different cultures. So if I, if I'm Aramaic, if, if I'm Syrian, if I'm black in America, you know, if I'm, if I'm Indian, it might be different things culturally that my nationality or my ethnicity does. And, and it's not that, any one culture is more powerful or more strong in Christ than any other, you know, uh, that's why I love when you brought up Galatians uh, 328. I was going to bring that up too, you know, because it, it is about Christ being all in all Christ is glorified in all of our different ways and our differences. And if we are representing Christ, we will have great relationship. Hence, the triune God, who is a living relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, I just want to highlight that. Now, you did say something that I think uh, some people might be confused by. So before we move on, can you elaborate on when you drew the comparison about uh, man and woman being made in the image of God, you mentioned God being described as a mother all throughout scripture. So can you unpack that a little bit? Cause I think if we just leave that there, I, I just don't want nobody to misconstrue what you were saying when you said, when you said that as it relates to uh, being related to women in humanity. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I think that, uh, when, you know, again, in Genesis, when it says that that uh, both male and female, he created them uh, in his image, then um, then I think that that has to do uh, that that really kind of reveals um, the uh, you know the aspect about the, the you know really kind of what I meant about God being like you know being feminine or that 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 God is you know if women are made in God's image, then that means that God also. Uh, is feminine and he is also masculine in the sense that if God, if men and women are created uh, in his image. And so, uh, and also just the other part about it, uh, I think the other thing I mentioned is also that uh, <clears throat> an interesting thing that, uh, that, we that we could look at is the fact that in, the, in Hebrew, actually the, the word for spirit, when it talks about the spirit of God is actually, or the spirit of God hovering above the waters is actually a feminine word. And so, uh, for example, the, the verb in Hebrew for hovering is actually in the feminine third feminine singular uh, tense. And so literally you could translate it as she hovered over the waters because the word uh, spirit, and actually uh, that's that gets into the book actually because um, in the, uh, I mentioned, for example, a lot of the Syriac, uh, the early the early church in Syriac speaking uh, parts of the world in Orhoi or Edessa, Nisibis, people like Ephraim the Syrian, Jacob of Sarug or Narsai or these other, these, the, you know, the, 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 the early Syriac theologians uh, started in like the Syria, kind of modern Syria, modern Southeast Turkey area, but then they ended up being missionaries going all over Asia. And really a lot of the whole fifth and uh, the, the third and fourth chapter of the book really deals primarily with uh, churches that are rooted in the Syriac tradition. And in that tradition, because Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic, and so in that language also, the word for Holy Spirit is technically a feminine name. People, writers like Ephraim the Syrian, uh, who is considered a doctor of the church in almost every major branch of Christianity, he will often refer to the Holy Spirit as a she, as a, wow. as, you know, in the feminine tense. Uh, and then the other piece of it, too, is that, again, throughout Scripture, uh, there are also images that liken God to, uh, like, a motherly type of creature, like, uh, you know, like a bear, like Hosea uh, 11 and uh, Hosea 13 describes God as a, uh, as a mother bear who's robbed of her cubs. Uh, or, you know, in Deuteronomy, God is described as a mother eagle uh, protecting mm -hmm. her, her, uh, her eggs. And then, um, you know, Isaiah talks about as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. And so there's all, you know, I think in the, um, and talks about God being, you know, like it likens God's anguish to like a, a woman in labor. And so, you know, I think in that in that sense, you know, again, if if women and men are equally made in the image of God, uh, then that means that uh, in that sense, uh, femininity reflects God and masculinity reflects God. And in the same way, culture also reflects God because God created us as 
different colors. And also, and this is where um, this is where I think some of our reform theologian friends uh, are helpful when they talk about the cultural mandate, right? The idea that it was part of God's creative intent from the beginning for humans to spread out and to create new culture that in the same way that God is the creator, that we also are lowercase c creators and that our creative capacity and faculty are, uh, are part and parcel of how we are made in the image of God. And so that was, so the, the diversity, the cultural diversity that we live in and the different languages, you know, against the idea, the common idea that I come across where people will say, well, actually cultural diversity was all just a curse from Genesis 11 and Babel. So, well, no, actually cultural diversity was already happening in the chapter before in the table of nations. And, and also if we look at Genesis 1, 26, 27, uh, a, a God's cultural mandate to fill the earth and to cultivate it uh, to, you know, I mean, subduing it is one way of translating, but we can also say to cultivate the earth to create culture that God's intention by creating us with different colors and, and calling us to spread out and to fill the earth and to cultivate it, to create culture, and that that was already happening in Genesis 10 through the creation of different nations, then we see that, cre that cultural diversity, like gender, is uh, part of God's intent and that God himself, if male and female, and if every culture are all made in God's image, then that means that God in his person retains all of these different aspects of humanity. Wow, man, it's so much. Uh, man, every 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 time you answer a question, it'd be like five or six points. I'd be wanting to unpack, I'd be, and I'll be like, which one do I <laughs> like? Which one do I pick up from? Let's just uh, I, okay. So let's talk a little bit about how the how the perception of Christianity did change at some point. You mentioned that it didn't begin with the transatlantic slave trade. So at what point did it progressively? begin to change yeah that's uh, so you know in the first chapter uh and, and i could just like you know I, what i tried to do in the first chapter is really kind of uh summarize the the um the the uh the as as my my friend and mentor dr soon chan Ra will call it the west in his book the next evangelicalism he talks about the western white cultural captivity of the church which yeah. basically means like again this perception of christianity being a white men's religion how did that happen how, where, at what point did white folks come and say, this Christian thing belongs to us. We're the ones in charge of it. We kind of frame what it looks like. And that's honestly a reality that we still in large part are in today. Um, where did that happen? I try, I try to kind of isolate the three developments uh, in church history. And the first one uh, starts really with the Roman Emperor Constantine, which is actually kind of a, um, a, a topic that comes up a lot in doing apologetics in the black yeah. community, right? Mm -hmm. Constantine is one of the favorite topics to talk right. about. And, and again, a lot of these different uh, religious movements and a lot of these ideologies that are, that are hostile to the gospel in our community or that resist the gospel or reject it, uh, a lot of them love to draw on Constantine. And a lot of them are kind of a mix of like truth mixed with falsehood. And yeah. kind of you got to kind of yeah. separate them because like yeah. a common thing that people will say is that, well, you know, uh, what's that? Oh, nothing. I, I I said like the books in the Bible. They say, well, books, you know, yeah. Constantine decided what books belong in the Bible. Yeah, Constantine decided what books belong in the Bible. He uh, you know, the, and everything is at the Council of Nicaea. You know, the Council of yeah. Nicaea, Constantine decided what books would be in the Bible. Never mind the fact that the Council of Carthage had a council, you know, almost a century before. And that's in Africa, by the way, that had a, a council almost 100 years before Nicaea. And they had already talked about what the Bible canon was. But yeah, they'll say Constantine decided everything. And, you know, nobody ever believed that Jesus was God until the Council of Nicaea. So it was all an invention by the Roman emperor so that he could go out and he could dominate the world in the name of Christianity. Now, you know, there's a lot of falsehood in that, but there's a, gra there's a grain of truth into that because what, what I focus on in the book is not that, not, not that Constantine or, you know, uh, that he invented the, you know, Christian doctrine or he invented the gospel or he invented, or he invented the Bible canon. But what I do point to is that he... Uh, and not even actually so much him, but more so actually the Roman Christians around him. Uh, they are really the ones that invented the idea that um, that Christianity was essentially Ro a Roman thing. That, uh, that 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 Christianity, as it was practiced in the Greco-Roman Empire, became seen as normative and as dominant. And the, uh, the and, and also the the uh, the effect of that, or the other side of that coin, is that Christians outside of the Roman Empire then began to 
struggle with and be faced with the false question of whether of, of between are they a Christian or are they a whatever they are, whether they're Nubian or, or Persian or Arabian or Indian or whatever. If they were not in the Roman Empire, a, a, a dynamic began because Christianity was now seen as the Roman religion, then people who weren't Roman were forced to, you know, wrestle with the question of, well, am I going to be a Christian or am I going to be who I am ethnically? Now, again, uh, again, biblically, that's not a question anybody should have to answer. That's not even a valid question because you shouldn't have to think about, am I a Christian or am I black? Am I a Christian or am I uh, Lakota? Am I a Christian or am I Japanese, right? That's, that's not a question anyone should even have to answer. But because of white supremacist Christianity and the white captivity of the church, that is a question that non-Western, non-white. All right, man. I, I don't want to miss nothing you're saying. I don't know if you're still talking. I don't know if you're still talking, but I don't want to miss nothing you're saying because you're saying some really good stuff. So, oh yeah, yeah. Do me a favor. See if you can. Um, the thing that I sent you should also have a number in it. Oh, okay. So I should call it on my phone. Wait, don't cut that off though. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try something. Put your put your thing on mute. Your screen on mute. Hopefully we can still see you. Um, hopefully it's not a bad echo. All right, so you're on mute there, and this is so you logged on on your computer, right? Okay. So yeah, so call on your phone. All right. Cool. All right. So we got that fixed. So we got that fixed. Praise the Lord. You know, Satan, you get no victory here. All right. <laughs> okay. So when you cut off, man, I don't even remember the last thing you uh, said. Do you remember what the last thing you said? I know the question was, we were basically discussing Westernized Christianity and how that imagery began. And I recall you mentioning how no one should ever have to say, well, you know, I'm Indian, but I'm also Christian. Like you shouldn't, ha they shouldn't have to choose between the two. I'm black, but I'm also Christian. Or am I, uh, do I got to choose between being Chinese and being Christian? Uh, you said something else mm -hmm. after that, but that's kind of the last thing that I fully remember. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Um, no, that's, that, that's, yeah, we, we were talking about kind of like, when did that whole dynamic happen yeah. where, you know, Christianity became seen as a Western, you know, white religion. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, I was talking about Constantine and, you know, the different, uh, you know, um, kind of ways in which during the fourth century, Christianity started to become seen as a Roman religion and how that had that adverse effect. Um, and then it just kind of continued from there. And so that's why a lot of groups in our community who say, you know, who talk about Constantine and the Roman Empire, there's a kernel of truth into what they're saying because, you know, Constantine did, or again, like I, like I said, it's really more so the, the Christians that supported Constantine. Uh, they were really, you know, they, they really represented uh, him as like kind of this savior, as this, um, uh, you know, God's agent in the world. And they, they really kind of bought on to kind of the Roman uh, nationalistic perception of it, Rome being like the, the light in the world and the, the, the civilizing force to all the barbarians. And they would kind of, they kind of syncretized that with Christianity and said, well, Constantine must be God's agent in the world. So there's, mm. it's really actually, you know, um, it's really actually hard to say what Constantine himself believed or what he, what he thought, but it's more in theologians like Eusebius and, uh, and, and other folks like later on Augustine in, in two cities who were showing kind of how Christians in the Roman empire began to see the Roman Empire's will and God's will as one and the same thing. So again, <laughs> talking about a cautionary tale for Christians in the United States today, we ain't gonna get into that. But um, that's really kind of the, 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 the beginning of how you know, Christi you know, Christians were seen as belonging in a way to like a particular group. Um, and again, that made it really difficult for, uh, for Christians in other places um, you know, to, to continue to be a part of their culture. I'll just read, um, I'll just read an excerpt uh, you know, from, um, you know, uh, from uh, actually the acts of the Persian martyrs. And um, the, uh, this is a good example in history to show that because this is, this is a Syriac text that was written throughout like the fourth and fifth and sixth century of Christians in the Persian empire uh, who were the, who were kind of the, the biggest victims of this kind of Romanizing and Westernizing of Christianity. They were the one of the first ones that had to, had to wrestle with that false question of, are you a per? Because again, the Persia was the main enemy of the Roman Empire. 
Mm. And now there were Christians in Persia and Christians in Roman Empire from the very beginning. We see Persians mentioned in Pentecost, Medes, Elamites, you know, those are all different Persian ethnicities. So there were Persians in, there were Christians in the Persian Empire from day one. And there's, even outside of the Bible, there's evidence of, in fact, per, the Persian church was one of the first ones to have ecumenical councils. This is something you can mention to those groups that want to say things like, well, it wasn't until Constantine at the Council of Nicaea, you could tell them, well, actually, bro, the Persian church, which was in a whole different empire, they had their own councils that had nothing to do with the Roman church or with Constantine. They were in a totally different nation, and they spoke a different language. They had different liturgy. They had different theology. And, I mean, it was still biblical, but it was, it was totally different than the theology of, of, of the Greek and Latin-speaking theologians in the Roman Empire. But when, again, once Constantine and the Roman emperors after him, uh, you know, started to say, well, Christianity is the Roman religion, then, uh, then Persian Christians started to become persecuted, and they were the Persian Empire was trying to tell them you need to convert to Zoroastrianism, and you can't be a Christian no more. And many of them resisted and said, "No, I'm a Christian." Um, and for many of them, being a Christian was not uh, antithetical to them being a Persian. That they had already been Christians for hundreds of years, and it was never a problem. In fact, Christians, you, we got to rewind before Constantine. Rem let's not forget that in the Roman Empire, Christians were being persecuted for their faith. They were being hauled into the Colosseum, and they were being, uh, they, their property was being stolen. They were being fired from their jobs. They were being discriminated against in the Roman Empire. So how are you going to say Christianity is a Roman religion, and it came from the Roman Empire, when they was killing Christians? But on the flip, in the Persian Empire, which is now Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq, Christians were actually safer in, the, in, in what we now call Iran and Iraq than they were in what we now call Europe. So in the 200s, it was actually safer to be a Christian in Iran than it was in Italy which is kind of crazy to think about, but that's wow. how it was back in the 200s. But I'll just read this quick excerpt that kind of shows, this is from a, this is from a Christian uh, named uh, Gustazad, who is a Persian Christian who's being, and this is on page 22 in the book, uh, that's dealing with this whole dynamic. Um, and he's being led before the Persian king, the Shah, and he's, and he's telling him, I refuse to renounce my faith in Christ. But he's saying, I want it to be clear. Um, I want it to be very clear that, I am not being uh, I am not being killed today because of of being a traitor. I am not a traitor to the Persian Empire. I'm Persian and proud. I want it to be known that I'm being killed because I'm a Christian and I refuse to renounce my faith. He says here, I have been true and sincere to all your hidden secrets, and I have been sincere to you and your father. Gushazad is talking to the Persian king. He said, I've been sincere to you and your father. And he's saying, I've been sincere to your secrets, as in, I'm not a traitor, I'm not a conspirator, I'm loyal to the Persian. He said, as you yourself said, you yourself know that I'm not a traitor. He says, now grant me this one request that I make of you. Let a herald go up and proclaim that Gustazad, who is being killed, is dying not because he divulged the secrets of the kingdom, nor because he was found at fault in anything else, but because he is a Christian and does not deny God. And then, yeah. he, was and then he was killed for his faith. And so that is a that's a very, I think, you know, clear example that there were non-Western Christians from the get go. But as soon as as soon as the West, the Roman Empire started to say, this is our religion, then that made it hard for Christians in other places to follow Jesus. And that's still been the case to this day. If you are a Christian in the Islamic world, in many parts of the Islamic world, you almost have to hide the fact that you're a Christian because people don't want to hear that because they associate Christianity with the Crusades and with Western globalization and Western colonialism. And so there are even many believers, for example, in the Middle East, who don't even want to call themselves Christians. They're believers, but they, they'll, they'll call themselves like uh, Nazarenes, which Nasada in Arabic, which is actually the term that Persian Christians were, I, I go into this in the book too, yeah. that's actually the term that Christians in the Persian Empire used for themselves. They didn't use the word Christian. Christian. That was actually more for Christians in the Roman Empire. Now, there's nothing wrong with the name Christian, but again, going back to what you said, different cultures do things different ways. And so well, who, who's to say that we have to call ourselves Christians versus Nazarenes or versus Masihi, which is actually another name that was in other parts of the Islamic world in the Middle East and even in Ethiopia, that was another name, which basically means little messiahs, which means the same thing as Christian, because what does Christian mean? Christian means one of the Christ. What does Christ mean? Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. So to say you are a Christian means you are one, of, you are a follower of the Christ. And to say you are a Messihi, or it means you are a follower of the Messiah, of the Messiah, of the Messiah, of the Messiah, the anointed one. And so again, you know, uh, 
that but all that to say i'm getting off track but that, that's an answer to your question of like that's really how how the problem started uh back in the fourth century you know kind of stay in uh you know kind of staying in in areas that people don't often talk about i, I want to ask you a little bit about you know syria you know can you tell us a little bit about the early church in syria and again we're talking about early church history that is important to, to it's really important to church history you know that are across different nations you know I, I may ask you about Ethiopia and even Egypt a little later but can you tell us a little bit about the early church in Syria oh man like the the Syrian church is such a powerful um you know place to really look into I mean thankfully uh in scholarship in the scholarly world like in the in the academic world uh in terms of like you know um uh you know in terms of like um Oh, it's got the window pop up. Um, it, yeah, just in terms of um, you know, scholars of religion and all that, Syriac uh, Christianity is starting to really become more like talked about, and thankfully, courses on religion are starting to become more uh, inclusive culturally speaking. But unfortunately, not as much in Christian seminaries or Christian colleges. So we got to get there. But the Syriac uh, early Syrian church is like a, one of the best places to start because, as I mentioned, the yeah. uh, the, Syri the the Syriac speaking church started in the region known as Syria, um, you know, but it in, eventually spread out to all over Asia, to India, to China, Central Asia, and it started in, a, a, you know, specifically the, the language of Syriac started in a little kingdom called Asrahini, which was in the area that was known as Roman Syria, and we now call Syria, but actually they called it Asrahini, and the capital was Orhoi, and that was the center of the Syriac language, and so, uh, and, and 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 the you know it, it, there were Christians there from from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, they um, there's even a story that in that tradition that the king of of Asrahini even sent a letter to Jesus himself and received the letter back uh, from Jesus that uh, that he requested Jesus to come and do miracles in his kingdom and that he could Jesus sent a letter back saying he couldn't come but that he would send one of his apostles. And that was Thaddeus or Adai, who eventually came and brought the gospel to this region. And, uh, and according to their tradition, uh, they became a Christian nation at the beginning of the church. Now, you know, there's some questions of the historicity of that, like, did Jesus actually send their king a letter? We don't know. We can't say he did or he didn't. But one thing we do know that's, more, that's a lot more, you know, that all historians agree on is that that, that area, that kingdom, Asrahini, became a Christian nation right, right at the turn of the third century. So right around the year 200. And so, again over a century before the Roman Empire, even before Armenia, which also was close to Asrahini, was the first Christian nation or the oldest currently existing Christian nation. Asrahini became a Christian nation, and Christianity began to grow and thrive in the Syriac language, especially when, uh, you know, so, and I go over this in the, um, in the third chapter, especially when the, there were theologians that started to do theology. One of the first systematic theological treatises, one of the first apologetics, we talk about apologetics, one of the first comprehensive defenses of the faith that ever was to be written in Christianity period was actually written in the Syriac language. It was called the Tahwitho, and it was written by a, a Persian theologian named Afraha. In fact, his nickname is the Persian Sage. And again, he, he, uh, he precedes the Council of Nicaea, and he was writing in the early 300s and even during and after the Council of Nicaea. So Christianity was already alive and well in the Persian Empire but with theologians like Afrahat. And But again, the way he did theology was in a very Syriac way. It was very close culturally to the Hebrew culture and to the Hebrew and Aramaic language. And so, for example, in his Takwitho or in his demonstrations, he actually organized the chapters as like an acrostic, beginning with each letter of the, of the Syriac alphabet, much like we see in Hebrew poetry, like in Psalm 119. And also, he draws heavily from the Old Testament. You know, that's another thing that is very different. Western theology usually draws heavily from the New Testament, and especially a lot of our Reformed mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, they love to draw from Paul. And I ain't saying nothing wrong with that. All, like you said, all 66 books are a love letter, right? But we know that most non-Western cultures that are Christians, they tend to draw from the Old Testament more than a lot of our white brothers and sisters in Christ do. We see that in our own tradition with African-American spirituals, drawing from the Exodus narrative and from uh, the prophets. And so you look at Afrod, he draws heavily from the Old Testament and from the New as well. And also he, his, his style of theology is very, it's much more Semitic in those ways, having the acrostic and drawing from the Old Testament. And he even was a part of, 
he was a part of a monastic community that was called the Benai Kiyoma, which means the sons and the daughters of the children of the covenant. And that was a style of monasticism or asceticism that was unique to Syria that Afrahat was a part of. And then, and then also Ephraim the Syrian, who I go in deep, great detail on him. He's the, he's the most powerful theologian to ever uh, write in the Syriac language and in that Syrian region. And one of the dope things I point out about him is that, again, this is an apologetic point, uh, that when people say, uh, you know, Roman Empire created, Constantine created the doctrine of Jesus' divinity, and nobody believed in it before him, you can actually point out, point to the fact that actually, uh, Ephraim the Syrian, he actually critiqued the use of the term homoousios. The Council of Nicaea uh, defended the idea, the, defended the belief that already was in the church, both in the Roman Empire, in the Persian Empire, uh, all over the world, that Jesus was divine. They didn't invent it. They didn't start saying it then. Christians all over the place had believed that, but they, that, if anything, that was the first time a Christian had said that Jesus wasn't divine, which was Arius. So the Council of Nicaea in the Roman Empire reaffirmed that Jesus is divine. Um, but again, Christians in other areas like the Persian Empire or Arabia or India, they weren't tripping off of that because they already knew Jesus was divine and they were already in those places. So they can't say that it came from the Roman Empire because it was already elsewhere. Not only that, but Western Roman and then later European, later, you know, North American, like Western theology has not been the only way to do theology, has not been normative, even though it always presents itself that way. Because the Council of Nicaea said, you got to say Jesus is homo usios. He is the same essence, homo usios. He is the same essence as God the Father. Now, that's fine. That's not a biblical term. And, you know, but it's fine if you want to use that term to articulate the biblical doctrine of Jesus' divinity. That's cool. But Ephraim the Syrian, who is, a, again, the most famous Syri Syriac theologian from the 4th century, he defended, uh, he already, in his own way, in his own culture, he was already clear on the fact. And most Christians in his area were clear on the fact that Jesus is divine. And he argued clearly against, for example, he wrote a whole, he wrote a whole poem about against Arianism, against the person who said that Jesus wasn't God. So Ephraim is clearly orthodox in his theology and clearly believes that Jesus is divine. But he actually rejected the term homoousios, even its Syriac translation, because he didn't feel that that was an appropriate term, and he didn't feel like that particular term and that church teaching should be elevated to the same level, like almost as scripture, like it was being. So mm -hmm. you have, again, at the beginning of the church, you have a non-Western theologian who's articulating orthodoxy, but it's in Semitic poetry, in Syriac language, and, in a, and with, with Syriac music, and in a, in a whole different way, he's doing, he's, he's defending biblical orthodoxy, but he's not doing it the Western way. In fact, he even says he takes some of the Western stuff he likes, but he pushes some of it away. Like Homuza said, I'm good on that. I don't need the homoousios, but he does take some of it. He's not like anti-Western or anti-Roman or anti-Greek, but he is, a, he is a, I think, a picture of what we as Christians of color need to do today. We need to, we need to be in unison with our white brothers and sisters. I'm not trying to say we don't want white theology. White theology is bad. Western theology is bad. You know, Euro-American or European theology is bad or Christianity is bad. Not at all. A lot of it is beautiful. I, like you said, we've been educated in it, and there's a lot of value in it. But at the same time, you know, there's also been a lot of oppressive things. And, and also, we have voices in our ancestry and in our culture that, that and ways in which we can articulate the Christian message and theology in unique ways. And so we need to, like Ephraim, uh, articulate orthodoxy in a unique way to our culture. And that's one of the, that, that's just, I mean, I could go on forever, but that's just <laughs> some of the highlights of theory, early Syrian theology. Wow. You know, and even, even people like Ignatius, you know, who is often brought up, you know, he was a disciple of John, you know, he was a very reputable person in, in, in the early church, as far as the people who weren't the disciples. Ignatius was a disciple of John. He was from Antioch, which is an ancient city in Syria, correct? That's right, yeah. I mean, oh man, there's so many, uh, there's so many more early church uh, theologians that were from Antioch and other parts of Syria. Um, you know, you mentioned Ignatius, Justin Martyr, you know, he was also from Asia Minor, uh, you know, and then you also got Tatian the Syrian, which was a, a student of, of Justin Martyr. And, uh, and um, I mean, yeah, there's so many. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, even though he eventually went to Gaul, he also was from Asia Minor. So there were, I mean, so many early theologians that were from Antioch and were from Asia Minor as well. And, um, and so I, I mentioned them briefly in my book. But one of the reasons I intentionally uh, really kind of emphasize people like Afrahat or Ephraim is because, for example, I, I bet you if we did a survey and asked people, you know, who have a, a decent, you know, 
uh, Christians who have a, you know, a decent familiarity with early church history, there's probably a much more likelihood that we've heard the name Ignatius or, mm-hmm. or uh, you know, uh, uh, Justin Martyr or, you know, um, or Irenaeus. But most people have not heard the name Ephraim the Syrian or Afrahat or Jacob right. Saru. And in the right. same way, if we go to Africa, most of us, whenever we talk about early African Christianity, we always talk about Tertullian, Augustine, Origen, Athanasius, and that's cool. I'm down with that. But we often don't talk about Shenouda and Zaur Yaakov and Benjamin of Alexandria and, and, uh, and Georgius of Sadla. And, the re- and, and so I think the reason why I tend to focus on these theologians is because the ones I'm talking about, they did not write in Greek or Latin. They wrote in Syriac. They wrote in Coptic, in Ethiopian, because the, uh, the, the Greek and the Latin language were like the languages of prestige. And so it's for that reason that many of us today are still more aware of early church theologians that wrote in Western languages, but we're not even aware of theologians that wrote in non-Western languages. And so that's part of the reason why in the book I mentioned those folks. But, and this is where, and I'm not trying to throw shade, I, I definitely would encourage folks to, like, for example, read Thomas Oden's book, How Africa Shaped the Western Christian Mind. Um, I think it's a great book, and it's a great starter. And I guess what this book hopes to do as a follow-up to that, as a compendium, is to say that one thing I wish Oden's book would have done more would, would be to also include the African theologians that wrote in African languages. <laughs> like, don't only, don't only focus on the Augustine, Tertullian, uh, Origen, Cyprian, Clement, don't only focus on the, the theologians that happen to write in Greek and Latin languages, because those European languages have been translated more. You can go on your, si- on your iPhone right now, and you can find the writings of Tertullian, Augustine, Athanasius. You can find them in English translation. Why? Because they wrote in Western languages, and they wrote according, remember I was saying how Afrahad and Ephraim, they didn't just write in another language, but they wrote in a totally different cultural mindset. They wrote in poetry. They wrote in acrostics. They wrote according to these non-Western cultures. And part of the reason the Greek and Latin folks have been more read is because they didn't just write in those languages, but they wrote according to their Hellenistic mindset. Augustine was an African, but he wrote according to like his heroes, like Ambrose of Milan and, and you know, Cicero. And all, he wrote in a very Hellenized, Romanized kind of way, which is cool. I ain't saying he ain't African, but like, I, I think it's also time that we look at African theologians who wrote in African languages according to African cultural mindset. And that's why I really, I mean, again, yes, there's, there's a whole lot of other folks that we can look at. But, um, but again, you, I mentioned you can go on your phone and get the writings of Tertullian or Ignatius or, 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 or Cyprian or whoever, but you cannot go on your phone and get the writings of Shenouda or of Zaria Kob or of Ephraim the Syrian or Afrahat, you know, just at the, at the click of a button like you can with the other ones. And that in and of itself, is white supremacy. That in and of itself is westernization in Christian theology, the fact that non-Western sources are so much less available. So that is exactly why this book is exists to help us know those, those other names that have been left out. Now, I was actually just about to ask you if you could actually teach us a little bit about Shenouda. Uh, and how Shenouda is important in church history, important church writings, even as it relates to the to the ancient uh, Egyptian gods objection that we often hear. You know, Shenouda has writings that even said, woe to those who worship the sun, right? Like he's even, like he, he's even saying, you know, that mm-hmm. that's not a good look, right? So can you teach us a little mm-hmm. bit about Shenouda? Where is Shenouda from? And why is Shenouda significant? Why should we know about him? Oh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, You know, yeah, like Shenouda is, Shenouda is important for world history. Like, let's just forget, let's for a second imagine that we're not Christian and that we don't have any kind of religious, you know, bias or whatever else. Like, let's just say we're historians or let's just say we're a teacher at a, at a school or at a university and we value, um, you know, as most people do, whatever the religion are, we value the languages and the literature of the entire world, right? Um, Shenouda is important just on that basis alone in that he is the single most prolific Egyptian writer in the history of Egypt. That's, that's important in and of itself, because Egypt is one of the ancient, most ancient civilizations in the world. Everybody's interested in Egypt. Everybody wants to know about Egypt all over the world because it's one of the most ancient civilizations. And, and most people don't even realize that its most prolific author, the single, the single author who, mo- who wrote the most in the Egyptian language, was a Christian. 
was a theologian. Hey, that, hey. I mean, that in and of itself is why Shadud is important. I, I, I want to jump in real quick and, and feel and please feel free to give us more background on Shanuda. But that's exactly why I asked you mm -hmm. uh, about Shanuda. Now, in case y'all didn't hear him and his passion, let, let y'all hear from a second voice. OK, history tells us this isn't even this isn't just our Christendom here speaking. History tells us that the most significant Egyptian author of late antiquity was a Christian. All right. Not just of late antiquity, ever. <laughs> so that includes that includes the Pharaonic time. That includes the 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 late Egypt, Middle Egypt, Ptolemaic Egypt, Persian Egypt, <laughs> late antique Egypt. Like you said, many it, in the history of the Egyptian language, in its three thousand year history, he is the he is wow. the most voluminous author in the history of that language. Wow, man. So this is and, and, and stuff like this is why this book is important. Right. Like this is why uh, this is one of the many reasons why books like this and this conversation is important. That's why it's called a multitude of all peoples. And we get an opportunity to familiarize ourselves with very important people in church history and history of the world who are really significant, who are from different areas that you know that, that, that they aren't just from Rome and, and things like that right and it's not just the names that we commonly hear I don't want to keep you too long Vince I could literally talk to you for weeks and I know you could talk about this for months if you know if, if, if you wanted to uh, I got a couple more for you uh, can you can you teach us a little bit about Emperor Decius? I hope I'm pronouncing uh, the name correctly uh, Emperor Decius and why is his role in history important in this discussion yeah, well, um, I think, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, Decius might be, uh, you know, he was a third century uh, emperor, like in the, you know, around 250s. And he was, as we mentioned earlier, he was greatly uh, persecuting Christians. Um, you know, Christian in the Roman Empire, Christians were persecuted. Now, I mentioned also that Christianity is just as old in the Persian Empire as it is in the Roman Empire. Right. And, and also other areas as well, like Armenia and Arabia and all that kind of stuff. But but um, but but Chris, persecution in the Roman Empire of Christians went kind of in waves, and one of the most intense wave of persecution was from Emperor Decius around in the mid 250s, and that actually sparked a uh, kind of a, a big controversy in the North African Church, um, you know, between like Cyprian and Novatian, and you know, uh, around whether or not Christians should be, um, you know, uh, can be forgiven if they renounce Christ during persecution. So that's another piece of Af just of African history that's wow. really important. Um, and so, uh, and so, you know, that, and that, and that, that, and that connects actually to, in a way to what you asked about Shenouda, because I, I, I mentioned, and I'll just say briefly, Shenouda is important to know about because he's the, for anybody, even like a, even a non-Christian should know about him because he's, like I said, he's, he wrote more Egyptian literature than any other Egyptian in Egyptian history, in the Egyptian language. Now, I mean, of course, in more modern times, there's probably people who wrote more in Arabic, but I mean, in the Egyptian language, Coptic is the Egyptian language uh, in its final phase before it became an extinct language. And, and he is its greatest author. He was a monastic leader in uh, Southern Egypt uh, and he had a big old monastery community uh, and, and communal monasticism really was born in Egypt and he was one of its most important leaders. But he also wrote a lot of different sermons and treatises about monastic life and also about Christian spirituality and about demonology. As you mentioned earlier, he wrote, he wrote copiously against Egyptian religion. So these comedic and, and, and conscious people talking about, well, we need to go back to our Egyptian roots. I'm like, well, if you go back to our Egyptian roots, you go find Jesus. Because Egyptians, <laughs> on, when man. they heard the name of Jesus, <laughs> When they heard the name of the Hebrew savior who lived in their country as a refugee, as a child, when they heard that he died on the cross and rose again for our sins, they walked away from Horus. They walked away from Isis and they didn't see it as a copy. Neither did the Egyptians that continued to practice their traditional religion. That nobody was looking at that like, oh, these Christians are copying off for us. If anything, they were saying, we don't like those Christians because they're so different from us. The biggest difference was the fact that they said, we don't pray to a bunch of gods. We pray only to Jesus. He is the only person that we worship. And whereas Egyptian gods, they'll pray to anything. They'll pray to Egypt people, you know, and they'll pray to, you know, uh, Assyrian gods, Nubian gods, Egyptian gods, Greek gods, whatever will get my crops to grow, whatever will get my wife pregnant, whatever will defeat me and defeat my enemies in battle, I'll pray to it. And Christians are saying, we only pray to Jesus. And that's why Shenouda was so keen to help people understand the difference between being a Christian. And he was Egyptian. He Again, he was the biggest Egyptian writer. And he was also... Uh, they, he, he and many other Christians were persecuted, going back to Decius. 
Also in Egypt, especially under Diocletian, who was another Roman emperor who persecuted Christians, Egyptians were some of the, the most like ride or die soldiers that was defending the gospel when Romans were persecuting them. And not only that, but Roman Christians were persecuting them. Because again, that's another apologetic thing to use is that Egy- uh, Egyptians like Athanasius, they continue to defend the doctrine of Jesus's, or of Jesus's divinity, even when Constantine sent him into exile. And Constantine's son sent him into exile. And so Egyptians have been going through persecution from day one, from Roman emperors like Decius and, and Diocletian, then from Roman Christians who, uh, who you know, didn't even want to uphold the doctrine of Jesus of any, or who had a different Christology from them later, and then later on by Muslims. But Shenouda was, again, in this long history of Egyptian Christian history and oppression. Uh, again, the Egyptian church, they even used the 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 the, um, the persecution of Diocletian as the starting point for their calendar to this day. So it, it's built in part of their DNA to suffer for the gospel, but also to stand boldly and proclaim the gospel, and also embrace their Egyptian culture. Uh, they rejected it at certain points, but they also embraced it at other points. They had ops in the monasteries, but they also, you know, Shenouda was saying, you know, again, we don't pray to gods and idols, and we don't we don't practice mummification, and that's what all of us got to do as Christians. We got to embrace part of our culture and reject some of it. And so, you know, I could go on forever, like you said, but those are some of the reasons why, um, you know, that's how Decius plays into the long history of persecution, but also that's some of the reasons why authors like Shenouda um, and many others are are so important for us to know about, especially as Christians. Wow, man. So I got a couple more for you before uh, before I let you go. I want to ask you a little bit about I want to ask you a little bit about Ethiopia, you know, because, you know, I've talked before, you know, I've, I've talked about, you know, Ethiopian manuscripts and things that we have that go as early as a, I, I think the number currently is AD 600 or something like that, which isn't the earliest, but it's still, you know, early enough to know that we have Christian literature, particularly in the, in the Ethiopian language. And of course, you know, there's King Azana, you know, from the, uh, or in the AD 300s, you know, but mm-hmm. you mentioned in your book, that we can know historically that Ethiopia became a predominantly Christian nation in the fourth century. How do we know that historically? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's really timely question because it, there was a paper that was just published, I think like this last winter, like six months ago of the earliest church that was discovered on the continent of Africa, on, in sub-Saharan Africa, which was found in Ethiopia. And um, I forget the name of the church. It's like, uh, yeah, I got to look it up. They, there, there's a, I forget the name of the church, but it was, it was discovered like, out in a rural area that's like somewhere between the ancient cities of Axum and Adulis. Now, Axum and Adulis were two of the most ancient cities uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, and they were both part of the quote-unquote Ethiopian empire. Now, Ethiopia is actually a European term. Uh, it's a Greek word that means black person. It means burnt face one. But in the ancient times, before Ethiopians began to take on this European name for themselves, the, the name of the kingdom was Habesha, or it was, it was uh, either Habesha or Agazi. Those are two names that were used in reference to the kingdom, and the capital was Axum. And so we know that the church that was just discovered and, and published by a team of archaeologists uh, was also, uh, that it also dates back to the fourth century in the 300s. So that's just one more piece of evidence, but there's a bunch more evidence. There's also uh, imperial inscriptions by King Azana himself. There's, I think, four of them total, if I'm not mistaken, that were written in Greek in in Geiz, which is the ancient language of Ethiopia, and in Sabaean, which is a, an Arabian language from across the Red Sea, which Ethiopia traded with quite a lot. And this, these inscriptions that were written in several languages tell of Azana and his victories over a couple of other uh, African tribes and. And, at, and he, the, the inscription says that he was going to protect a couple of African tribes from some other African tribes that called out for help. Um, and then he gives credit to God, and he says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he gives thanks to God Christ, he says. And, uh, and, and he, gives, he gives praise to God Christ, which is an interesting side note, because remember, in the 300s, uh, the 330s and 340s, the Roman Empire was actually under Arian leadership at that time, Constantine and his son Constantius. So at a time when the Roman Empire was under Arian heretical leadership, belief that Jesus wasn't God, the king of Ethiopia was writing imperial inscriptions calling Jesus God. Wow. So Africans were upholding orthodoxy at a time that Europeans were, at least their imperial leadership, were giving way to heresy. 
So wow. you, you can't nobody say that this stuff came from uh, the, you know, from the white man or from, from, because the missionary that brought the gospel to Adana was from Syria. He was from Tyre, name was Prometheus, and he brought the gospel. And here's the irony. We often, I was just actually reading a book earlier today, and it's so often the thing as black people that Christianity started for us in slavery. But Christianity started for us, again, in North Africa, Egypt, in Nubia, it started freely. But with Ethiopia, there's an there's a, there's a irony in the fact that not only did Christianity not start for us as the slaves, but actually in Ethiopia, Christianity came in by a slave. But it was a Assyrian who was the slave, and it was the Africans who were the slave owners. Who heard, who heard the gospel from a Middle Eastern slave, and the king of Ethiopia, Izana, believed freely in the gospel and freely embraced Christianity as the religion of Ethiopia. And we know that not only from imperial inscriptions in Ethiopia by Izana, not only from churches that have just recently been discovered that are from the 300, but we also know it from Athanasius' own writing in his, in his apology against Constantius, who was the Arian emperor of, of Rome at the time, uh, Athanasius and Constantius wrote letters to each other about Prometheus and about Azana, how he became a Christian king. And also we know it from uh, Rufinus, who was a Roman church historian and tells the story of Prometheus. So there are multiple authors, all from the 300s, and there's archaeological inscriptions and buildings that are all make it extremely clear, without a doubt, that Ethiopia was a Christian nation in the 300s. Man, I'm so glad I asked you that question. You said something. I, I can you repeat something because I don't I don't want nobody to miss that. I don't even want to repeat it in my voice. I want you to say it. You said that there was a slave owner who received the gospel from a slave. Now, the the knock is almost always that Christianity spread because of we had the sword. First of all, do your research. Like they always like to tell Christians, you know, do your research. First of all, do your research. But that is a very important point. That is a very important point. If you think about this in African history, that there is a slave owner who heard the gospel from a slave, from a person who literally was not the person in power at that point, the person who had the authority. However, the slave owner received the gospel and and heard can, can can you repeat that one more time elaborate on that real quick mm -hmm. and that can be what we close on yeah no that's i i, I i'm glad you see the <laughs> the importance of that point and the irony of that point for those of us on right. this side of the middle passage and those of us on this side of jim crow and mass incarceration right. and uh and colonial christian slave ships that uh, in the fourth century right in the fourth century a thousand years before any of that stuff yeah. that one of the oldest sub-saharan african civilizations in the world ethiopia or agazi as they called itself at that point that ethiopia was one of the most powerful nations in antiquity they they were on the same level as the roman empire the persian empire with arabian south arabians india they were right at the at the Horn of Africa along the Red Sea trading and engaged. They were an ancient empire to be reckoned with. They were highly esteemed by ain't classical like Greek historians like Herodotus and, and other Greek. And they, this was this was a powerful African nation. And black people, a black African, Christ, uh, a black African nation that was powerful. And the first their first introduction to the gospel of Jesus Christ, these black people, these ancient African kings. And queens, the first time they heard about Jesus was from a Syrian slave who was a slave in their imperial court. So Prometheus, his uncle, was a traitor, and his, and his uncle and him and his cousin, were his brother, were on a trip. Rufinus tells this story, the church story in the fourth century. They were on they were they were on a sea a, a, a sea trading trip and. They became uh, attacked. They got attacked by pirates, and his uncle was killed. And the two boys, Prometheus and Odysseus, these two Syrian boys, were taken as slaves into the imperial court of Ezana. And Ezana was a prince at the time, a young man. And his parents were the king and queen. And these African kings and queens and prince had two Syrian slaves who were Christians. And they shared the gospel with them. And the queen became a Christian, and she allowed them to spread the gospel all throughout Ethiopia. 
these slaves came into Africa as Christians and they shared the gospel freely and the king and queen and and then later the prince who would become king freely accepted the gospel. Nobody forced them to do it. There was no there was no uh, Berlin conference. There was no gun. There was no slave ship. There was no gunpowder. There was no colonization. They were they were the ones in charge. These were this was an ancient African kingdom that heard the gospel from a Syrian slave and freely believed in Jesus Christ and freely accepted Christianity as the national religion and in so doing became the first African Christian nation. And not only that, but wow. they are also the first, they're the only African nation, the only black country, not just African, but even in the even in the Caribbean, they are the only black country to this day to have never been colonized. The oldest black Christian country in the world is one of the only oldest black countries, period, is also the only one never to have been colonized. Why don't more people know this? I mean, A, because they haven't read your book. <laughs> <laughs> because you know like the uh what is it those infomercials you know if you love what he's saying trust me when i say wait there's more <laughs> you know but it's like wow man just hearing you say all this stuff and highlighting it and then elaborating it it's just so fascinating in two contexts i won't lie it's it's fascinating in general about when we think about the multitudes of all peoples all of these very influential people who wanted to do things to spread the gospel or even some of them they're influential people they wanted to do things to silence the gospel but no matter how you slice it it's one person from over here one person from over there this person from over here whether they're pro-christianity or trying to silence christianity we see that it is on the radar of all of these Gospel still continue to spread across so many nations. And this is in the first few centuries that we've had. You know, I think the latest comment, the oldest thing that I brought up in this particular conversation was in 8600 or something. Matter of fact, I think that's something that I just said. I didn't even ask you about that. I think everything I asked you was in the 8300s or the 400s, the latest, you know, and, and mm -hmm. wow. I mean, just look at how much God has spread his word and the works of jesus christ and the power of the holy ghost like how do you not get, <laughs> get excited like oh my goodness oh mm -hmm. man. is it any mm -hmm. man i i'm not gonna keep you all day i promise you i could if i wanted to is, is it anything that is, is there anything that's like on your heart or on your mind that you want to mention, or maybe it's something that you mentioned already, but you just kind of want to highlight, make sure people get, is there any, any last word of, of that sort that you want to mention? Man, I just, man, I just appreciate this time and this conversation. And, and I would just summarize, man, like both me as a pastor and as a scholar, like the, the, the goal of all of this is to help us uh, understand that, we are made in God's image. You know, I, I, I went through identity struggles as a young person where I felt like my, my urban West Side St. Louis hood culture was just wrong. And, and uh, God used like Christian hip hop folks to minister to me and help me understand that like who I am is a part, who I am culturally is a part of my God maybe. And it's a part of God. Like we talked about earlier, like all of the diversity with which he created humanity is a reflection of the divine. And so, to, and so the, the passage that God spoke to me on was the same thing he told peter when god told peter kill and eat and peter said no surely not lord i've never touched anything unclean and god told peter do not call unclean what i have made clean and god has made a multitude of all peoples and and even though because of the history of racism we we have a you know uh, you know we we have a common belief that there are certain cultures that are you know uh, more Christian than others or cert, you know uh, you know certain things can't be brought in. Uh, I, I just want to encourage people to know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, all these you know all of our cultural identities can be redeemed and are brought into the heavenly multitude that John saw in the eschaton. And so I want to encourage everybody else: do not call unclean what God has made clean. Do not hate yourself. Don't hate your natural hair, your natural skin color, your natural culture, your vibe, your flow, your language, your swag, like whatever your culture is, whatever your tradition is, it's a part of the heavenly multitude and we cannot hate it. We cannot despise it. Yeah, there's things about it that's got to be transformed, but that's true for everybody. But there's also a part about it is an integral part that God is pulling into himself and, and it's all to his glory. It was made to glorify him. And that's what it's all about. 
So let's glorify God by loving ourselves and embracing who we are. Man, you got me happy right there, man. You got me, you got me happy right there. Praise the Lord, bro. Praise the Lord. So listen, y'all, listen. This book, this is your first uh, official book. I know we've all been asking you, man, write a book, write a book, write a book. You know, this is your first official book. I know you got another one in the works. Listen. Yep, two. Two in the works. Praise the Lord, man. Yeah. Listen, y'all, if y'all enjoyed this interview, a fraction of how much I have, get this book. Get it. I promise you, you will be blessed. You will be informed. If you're listening to this and you're not a believer, because Vince, you know, we do have listeners who aren't, mm -hmm. who aren't believers who tune in. And I praise the Lord for mm -hmm. that. But look, check this out. If you're mm -hmm. not a believer and you're not convinced yet or whatever, but you're a person who does their research, get the book, bro. Get the book. Mm -hmm. This is all facts. Like this is facts historical facts and man this is just a very powerful piece of work thank you so much for sharing uh fractions of it on is here ruin radio dr vince bantu and i strongly recommend this book and also you know it, 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 even if it's just support first of all you're gonna be blessed so get the book but also support people like dr vince bantu y'all support him you know you know, let his book show up on the on the top seller list because folks like this who have a passion, they'll speak as much as possible, as long as possible, and, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, man, you know, you know, let's pour into this brother. So uh, again, Dr. Vince Bantu, thank you so much for your time. I highly recommend the book, A Multitude of All Peoples. And as we always ask, and before I even say that, I like to mention this, you may or may not be reformed, but we should all be informed. And this book is a perfect way to do that. So once again, as we always ask y'all, is he a real one? Yes, he is. And the he that we talking about mm. is Jesus, y'all. A, A, amen. Yeah. <laughs>